I'm just a picture of calmness today. <laughs> there was a little more traffic on the interstate than I expected, so thank you for bearing with me. Uh, I really always try to get places earlier than, than later, and so I was in this kind of panic mode as I was out on the bypass just a while ago. Um, thank you so much for having me. I am always quite delighted to come and talk to you. Um, a slightly different... Uh, a slightly different audience from the audience I'm accustomed to teaching at Volunteer State. And, uh, you know, it's that time, the Ides of the semester, when uh, things are not looking good for some of my students. So uh, I'm, delight I'm delighted to be here where I don't have to give you a test and evaluate how much history you actually have learned today. Sally Levine asked me to come in and talk to you for one piece of this program on protest movements, and guess which part they assigned me? <laughs> you know, they assigned me the women. And so I thought that today I would, would try to, as I was preparing for this, I thought I would try to pick out some things that perhaps all of you experienced in your lifetime, but your memory just simply hasn't been jogged quite uh, about these things quite, uh, quite recently. And so I thought we would bring this in. Now, I'm sure that Professor Gerstle last week talked about protest movements as a general group and uh, what people, how people become protesters or join a movement instead of just being an activist. And also how that protest movements we normally associate with the politically voiceless in this country. Now, I suppose if we were really trying to look at protest movements from the beginning of American history all the way up to the present, I guess we would start with those ladies who boycotted the English tea uh, back before 1776. And there were certainly Cherokee women in Tennessee who were always voicing the fact that with the coming of the Europeans, the Anglo-Americans across the mountain, their privilege as the matriarchs of their society and their political position was being threatened or actually taken away from them. We could look at the women, the, the young women, who got jobs in the Lowell Mills in Massachusetts in the late, 19, late 1820s, early 1830s, and how those women organized themselves together to protest against their hours and their wages. And what came out of that was that the people who owned those textile mills where they were working uh, 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 realized, you know, we thought we were doing these girls a favor. We provided them a lovely dormitory to live in. We provided them a matron so that they wouldn't be too wayward and get into mischief here and there. And this is the thanks we get. But the dormitory, the boarding house that they were provided, actually gave them an opportunity to talk. And you do know that women like to talk when they get together. So what I want to do is put the women, I want to move beyond woman suffrage today, which is a story that at least half of you in this room have heard me tell. It is a fascinating story how women got the right to vote and the role that Tennessee had here in that pivotal moment when the 36th state was called on to ratify. Clearly it was the seeds of that movement that really led to another wave of feminism much later in, in your lifetime and mine as well. Now, I do want to say, I guess I should make one comment about the suffrage movement here. And the comment that I really want to make is that the suffrage movement was relatively small compared to this very enormous women's Christian temperance union that had organized nationally and had swept the country, rural, urban alike. The WCTU was this enormous organization, and suffrage was really a pretty small part. Uh, not all of the women in the temperance union really supported suffrage, and not all of the suffragists supported temperance. 
But the temperance movement had a broad spectrum of women from all political uh, aspects of life. It's this kind of this notion, as much as anything, that really had grown out of those reform movements before the Civil War that uh, wanted to purify humanity, particularly you men who were not uh, towing the line and causing so much of the trouble in the eyes of many of these women reformers. Uh, but here we have uh, the suffragist taking to the street. The, the temperance ladies had done the very same thing, just not quite to the level of visibility that the suffragist had. The suffragist uh, did some things that were really uh, newsworthy. In other words, they knew how to get themselves uh, the attention of the reporters and how to make the news, and they did that very effectively. Uh, the suffrage movement had really kind of stalled there during Woodrow Wilson's presidency. The suffragists uh, weren't getting very far. far. The N National American Woman Suffrage Association, led by Dr. Anna Howard Shaw and then Carrie Chapman Catt, they, were, they, they debated as to what the best way to do this was. To some degree, should we have an amendment to the Constitution? Should we let each state do it? And of course, down here in the South, we certainly wanted it state by state by state so that we could control exactly what was going on down here in our state. Because after all, if white women could vote in the South, what about African American women? And most of the southern states, including Tennessee, had had, had made very stringent franchise laws for black men so that it, although there were African American men in Tennessee who voted, clearly there was a large proportion of African American men who didn't vote. So we were very nervous about all of this, but we are, there are many women in Tennessee who want the right to vote. Well, along to the Suffrage Association comes none other than Alice Paul. Your friend and mine, John Siegenthaler, is writing a biography of Alice Paul, and she is the kind of person John would really enjoy writing about because she is a feisty, independent woman. Alice Paul had grown up in a Quaker family, been educated, went over to England um, uh, to study, and while she was in England, she had the opportunity to observe uh, the English suffragist in action. She saw the actions they were doing, the visible protest, much more visible than anything the American women had done. Among other things, those English women were uh, 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 even going so far as to go on hunger strikes to draw attention to their desire to vote. So Alice Paul comes back to the United States, joins the Suffrage Association, and Carrie Chapman Catt uh, says, maybe this is the spark of life we need. So Alice Paul and her friend Lucy Burns join the Suffrage Association, and Mrs. Catt promptly puts those two women in charge of a branch over here of the Suffrage Association called the Congressional Union. And those women in the Congressional Union were going to get the attention of Congress by way of getting the attention of their constituents. Now, imagine the year is 1913. Woodrow Wilson has been elected president. The Republican Party had divided between Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft, enabling the Democrat Wilson to go to the White House. Here was a man with a strong-willed wife and three daughters, and yet Woodrow Wilson didn't want a position on women voting. So Woodrow Wilson was on the fence. He was uncommitted. So what does Alice Paul and the Congressional Union decide to do? Let's upstage his inaugural. What these women decided to do was the day before the president's inauguration, they would have their own march on Washington. And indeed, they marched. If nothing else, 
It was the whole sheer audacity of the thing that brought out the crowds. And thousands and thousands of people came to watch these 5,000 women marching down the street demanding the right to vote. Yes, it accomplished their mission. Miss Cat was not particularly happy about this because she really was a moderate in every sense of the word and she really did not want to offend or alienate men, particularly congressmen. So, sooner or later, you know that Alice Paul and her group of more active suffragists, including some women from Tennessee, actually, draw, uh, break away from the National Association for Woman Suffrage and create their own organization, the Women's Party. And these are the women who, during World War I, chained themselves to the fence in front of the White House saying, Mr. President, what are you going to do about woman suffrage? They also had some signs comparing our president, Woodrow Wilson, to the Kaiser. Not a sentiment that went over well inside that fence, I must say. So these women call themselves the silent sentinels. They had these signs but they themselves spoke nothing. So here we see this is the environment when Tennessee ratifies the, 20, the 19th Amendment in 1920 after World War I. The suffrage organization had come together, then broken apart, but you've got the most historians I think would agree that it was both tactics that really helped turn the tide. Alice Paul clearly brought the attention to uh, the problems uh, of women not voting dramatically and Miss Cat presented this, uh, we are working within the system, we have nothing to threat, threaten you with Fred, nothing at all. <laughs> so after World War I is over, after women get the right to vote, uh, Alice Paul and her group, the National Women's Party, say, okay, now we must go a step further. Now that we have the right to vote, we need complete equality. We need our rights as citizens, complete uh, equality with the men as citizens of the United States. So they introduced into Congress in 1922-23 an Equal Rights Amendment. Now this is where the bells in your head should be going off because you all remember the fight about the ERA. And it started right after World War I. And so the debate began. Miss Katz's organization, NASA, the National American Woman Suffrage Association, has turned into the League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters philosophy about women is that we need protective legislation to protect women in the workplace. We, uh, the elite women, the women who are not working, have a responsibility to do what we can to help those women who are working and therefore we have to have protective legislation, not complete equality. And so that is where the road divided. Miss Paul and her Women's Party kept getting this amendment introduced and just like the suffrage amendment, it kept floundering and floundering and floundering. World War II comes along and then we go into the 50s and in 1960, John F. Kennedy is elected President of the United States. You all remember this. You can, you, everybody in this room knows where they were that November day of 63. So one of the things that John F. Kennedy did was to create a commi commission on the status of women. And this commission was to be headed by none other than Eleanor Roosevelt, and it was a very prestigious commission to look at the situation uh, that American women found themselves in in the early 1960s, now that we are fully into the Cold War years. So it is in this environment we have begun to talk about what the status of women actually is 
that the Civil Rights Bill of, 18, well, of 1964 becomes a, a reality. John F. Kennedy is assassinated. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, as president, decides that he will be able to, as, as Mr. Caro refers to him, the master of the Senate, he will be able to get landmark civil rights legislation passed to prohibit a discrimination of civil rights across the country, and specifically of that act, Title VII of that act would prohibit discrimination in employment on the basis of race. Now, we don't really know what the motives of uh, Virginia Representative Howard Smith were. His motives undoubtedly were very complex, but we know that he was opposed to this Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. He was opposed to the whole bill in general. So Representative Smith decided, for whatever reason, to add an amendment to Title VII of the Civil Rights Act that was coming down the pike to prohibit discrimination not only on the basis of race, but also on the basis of sex. Now you can imagine, this got a few laughs here and there in Congress, but Alice Paul was dead serious about, and the Women's Party, about seeing this through. Alice Paul did not die until the 1970s, about 77, I think. Uh, so she was still very much in the picture at this point. Smith, although he was a fairly conservative Southern representative, Smith was, in fact, uh, one of Alice, Alice Smith's allies in Congress. He had sponsored the ERA for many years, but he opposed the Civil Rights Bill. So it seemed rather facetious that he would stick this amendment on there to be debated. We don't know whether this was just simply a gesture of Southern chivalry on his part or what the motive was there. But whatever it was, it created great havoc. It is the source of tremendous controversy because, once again, women have to take a position on this. And over there in the Department of Labor is Esther Peterson, who says, this is not what we need. It's going too far, too quickly. Women need protective legislation. And right there along with Esther Peterson, were the women from the League of Women Voters. Many of us know these women quite well, uh, at least in the history books we know them. Uh, the League of Women Voters really said, we don't want to support this either, this amendment to Title VII. But joining the support for Smith's amendment was Senator Margaret Chase Smith and Representative Martha Griffiths and the Civil Rights Act of, eight, of 1964 passed and was signed by President Johnson. Now, the next place we're going to see this kind of coming boiling up, equal rights or protective legislation, is in the Equal Employment Opportuni uh, Opportunities Commission. Suddenly, with the Civil Rights Amendment, they are besieged with complaints not really any more about race. I mean, there are some, there are plenty of complaints about race, yes. But to everybody's surprise, they are besieged with complaints from women because they feel they are being discriminated against in the workplace simply because they are women. And the EEOC, by and large, chooses to ignore these complaints and these women. Well, now you know how well that's going to go off because we're not dealing with people who are going to be silent here. And so speaking out very effectively is a woman who's now quite uh, a national name, Betty Friedan. Betty Friedan had written in, and published in 1957, I think, uh, the late 1950s, she had published a book called The Feminine Mystique. And I just have a feeling there are a lot of you ladies here who have read that book. It really is quite fascinating now to look at what it said then 
and what it didn't say then. But what she said is really that in a, 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 a nutshell, I suppose, what she said is that educated women are being underutilized and that they are, are doing things that, that are not meaningful to them themselves. Uh, they need to be uh, out there doing more fulfilling things than baking cookies uh, running carpools uh, and, and playing bridge in the afternoon. So here we have Betty Friedan now deciding she's going to speak out against the EEOC's uh, ignoring of women. And so with her, she and another group of, of women, there were I think 28 who came together, they said we need a brand new women's organization. The Women's Party is a kind of a one-note song. We need a women's organization and we need what the Women's Party was asking for, equality. We need it now. And so thus was born the National Organization for Women, 1966. And what their mission was was to bring women into full participation into the mainstream of all facets of American society. And so here with the Title IX addition to civil rights and the creation of now, we move into another wave of feminism. We look back there at the, uh, at the period of the WCTU and the women, uh, period of women's suffrage as being the first wave of feminism well now another wave is coming uh, across the ocean and is soon going to be to the shore. These women were vocal and they also, like Alice Paul, who's quite elderly by this time, they know how to get attention and they do it quite well. So it is the women in the National Organization for Women that decide that they are going to resurrect the ERA and get it uh, passed. Well, the people in the National Organization of Women cannot avoid getting into controversy themselves. And the subject then gets to be, how far is this equality going? And of course, we're still debating that question right here in 2012. What does equality mean? And you can imagine the eyebrows that were raised when the ladies of now, the women of now said, we acknowledge the oppression of lesbians as a legitimate concern of feminism. And so now we have another split. This time it is between the egalitarians, the people who believe in equality, and the people who are going even a step further and say, we don't just believe in equality, we believe in liberation. We want to be completely liberated to do whatever we please with whomever we please. And I really do think it took both of these trains coming down uh, tracks that were side by side to get the attention uh, of the American public and in particular the attention of the women. Now some of you will recall uh, the days when the Miss America pageant was the big Saturday night television uh, extravaganza of September. Uh, that, that was before the March Madness, of course. And um, uh, the Miss America pageant hosted by Burt Parks was quite the thing. And so some of the women in now decide they're going to have a little fun, get a lot of attention, they decide that they are going to break, symbolically break away the bonds of male oppression by having a trash can out there in front of the hall in Atlantic City where the pageant's going on and they're all going to very ceremonially drop their bras, their corsets, anything that held them back into this freedom can. Now, if you go on the internet, you will find uh, all manner of truth versus uh, fiction in this. 
Some people say it happened. Some say it wasn't like that. It was just more, instead of a big bonfire, it was a smoldering uh, of sorts deep in this can. But nonetheless, they protested and that became the rage. And you know, you all remember, this is 69, I was in college by then, and you remember that this was the Vietnam War era, so we got a lot of things to protest about now that it's the, the 60s. We've got lots of protests going on. But the, 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 on college campuses, even at a conservative institution like Baylor University, where I was being sheltered and educated, um, even there, there were symbolic bra burnings going on at Baylor. Whether it happened in Atlantic City or not was not the point. So, women are getting attention. The war is raging. Women are very much a part of the anti-war movement and out of this group, out of, coming out of now, and, and women are really jumping very quickly into the national organization of women, particularly young women, because they like the message that these folks have. So it, right there, coming out of that, the women decide to stage a strike for equality. And one of the issues that they really wanted to see brought to the national agenda we really hadn't talked too much about up to this point in, in, in society, in American society, and that was daycare and abortion rights. So this is August 26th, the, the day that the Secretary of State officially signed the 19th Amendment into law after Tennessee had ratified it. August 26th, 1970, they have the Women's Strike for Equality. It is the largest women's demonstration ever, and it gets lots of attention. And in particular, it gets attention for the Equal Rights Amendment. Now keep in mind, Richard Nixon is in the White House now at this point in 1970. So this really seems to generate the momentum that the Equal Rights Amendment really needed. And yes, by this time, the League of Women Voters, the Business and Professional Women's Groups, the AAUW, all of these women have, become, have, have joined the National Organization of Women in supporting the ERA added to the Constitution. So the amendment passes both houses of Congress the, by huge majorities. In the House, it passed by a vote of 354 to 23. I mean, that's huge. That is, we, that's enormous. It won't happen on any subject, I don't think, right now. Uh, <laughs> in the Senate, the vote was 84 to 8. Now, that's an enormous vote of support. Now, why do those legislators vote for it? You know why these guys in the legislature vote for something? Because they think their constituents want it, right? So, okay, well that seems like the voice of the country has spoken. President Nixon signs it into law. He too has two daughters. Uh, and so he signs this. And all that now has to happen is it has to go out to the states to be ratified. Done deal. Look at the vote. Look at the vote here. And so the only, the only slight problem, but don't worry about this, don't worry about this, is that in the bill they have put in, a, put in it a 10-year time limit. In other words, the amendment has to be ratified by, it, with, by 1982. It, well, actually, it started out. Now, Sam, you're going to have to help me with this here uh, because I can, I can tell I'm on, I'm on thin ice. Uh, the, uh, it, it, the amendment had a time limit on it specifying that it had to be ratified, and then they got an extension for two years to 1982. So it had an eight-year time limit and then to be extended for two years. And so, so the, there's a great deal of excitement it's going to pass. And the Tennessee General Assembly votes it through. No controversy whatsoever here in Tennessee. And then a woman with a law degree, very highly educated, 
Woman uh, on the outskirts of St. Louis, Phyllis Schlafly organizes a Stop ERA campaign. Now, originally, the big sticker in the amendment, well, it was not the amendment, but that what came through Congress on the heels of the Equal Rights Amendment was a comprehensive child development bill. And Ms. Sh Mrs. Schlafly saw this as a creation of a set, a national network of daycare centers. You're going to have to work, you're going to have to work, you're going to put your kids in these state-run, government-run daycare centers. Doesn't that sound like what goes on in Russia with those women wearing those army boots, going to the factories every day? And this communal approach to child rearing was how it was put, uh, was a threat to families. It has, as uh, President Nixon himself said, family weakening implications. And so President Nixon, who had signed the ERA, now says, I can't sign this. He denounces this child care bill. And that was what really got the Schlafly machine rolling down the track. So in 1972, she takes her highly uh, organized group of Stop ERA folks and they form the Eagle Forum. And then, 1973, the Supreme Court hands down the decision of Roe versus Wade, which if there was, if Ms. Schlafly didn't already have a fire burning, this was gasoline now to be poured and ignited. And from that point forward, there, there was a great outcry to stop the ERA. So here in Tennessee, we've already ratified it. We were among the first. No problem here. But it's amazing how much influence women can have on legislators. The Eagle Forum became very highly organized here, and they worked very effectively <laughs> with the General Assembly to convince them that this was not in the best interest of Tennesseans. And Mrs. Schlafly really was able to focus on a couple of key issues that I think uh, really resonated with folks. Keep in mind, we're still in Vietnam. Uh, and one of the things that she was concerned about was women in the military. That was a, a, a very enormous uh, issue for Mrs. Schlafly, and that was something that people could, could, could easily understand. So, Tennessee's legislature decides to change its mind. Even though we had already ratified it, we decided to take another vote and undo the vote we had taken. Now, you lawyers here, Gil, will have to tell me is that constitutional or not. But you can make an argument, but ultimately a court is going to have to decide whether any state can resend a vote to a, approve an amendment that they've already taken. And with Phyllis Schlafly's full support and with the Iraq hostage crisis, financial troubles in the country, Jimmy Carter having a difficult time in the White House, uh, Mrs. Schlafly uh, gives her full political support to Ronald Reagan in 1980, and he is elected president. The now with the extension of the ERA, the deadline is June 30th, 1982 for the Equal Rights Amendment to dissolve. If it's not ratified by then, it's out. And uh, at the time that this took place, inside the Reagan White House, there was a lot of nervousness going on because his aides, particularly people like Elizabeth Dole, wanted to keep Mrs. Schlafly at arm's length, but she certainly felt that she had worked to get Ronald Reagan elected, and therefore she had his ear. So you see in the Reagan White House this kind of tugging and pulling here uh, to try to keep her at bay and alternately uh, let her have a voice. So the um, Eagle Forum and the Stop ERA campaign organized a massive national celebration 
uh, at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington on June 30th. Um, and and uh, they expect the president to come. I, I worked several years ago in the Reagan Library in um, Simi Valley, California, a beautiful place to work and a beautiful, beautiful vista there outside the reading room. And uh, as I looked through all of this correspondence, it was really quite interesting. They wanted President Reagan to write her a handwritten note of regret, which he did, but the wording had to be just so. So there were lots of little drafts and, you know, to write one sentence, uh, Nancy and I we can't come tonight, or something to that effect. So President Reagan and Nancy Reagan do not go over to this Stop ERA celebration, but it goes on as planned. And at midnight, with the band striking up, ding dong, the witch is dead, you can imagine the balloons flying. Everybody uh, is at the Mayflower Hotel is rejoicing. They have accomplished their mission. Now, I think it's fair to say that the women's movement lost that battle, but they won the war in many, many respects. Although they really... Uh, there are many women who still very much feel we need an Equal Rights Amendment. Others would say the National Organization for Women served its purpose. It, it did what it needed to do, which was bring attention to employment issues and employment equality for women. And uh, the National Organization for Women still exists. Some of you may be members of it. Uh, its membership over the years has dramatically declined because uh, as with the case of most voluntary women's organizations, the success allowing women to work at a variety of different jobs has meant that there are less women to do uh, volunteer work in, within these organizations. Uh, Mrs. Schlafly uh, has a, a, a large center uh, in Kansas City uh, in a library. I, I have not been there. I did actually talk to her on the phone one day and she was quite charming. She is very eager to talk to Carol Busey from Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, so uh, she's, she's often, more often than not, I hear from other scholars, she will greet the guests and talk to you about whatever you're working on. Uh, it's hard today, I think, to get a lot of women excited about March, Women's History Month. You know, Women's History Month just kind of comes and goes. And I don't know, Dwight, have I seen anything in the Tennessean about Women's History Month? I don't know whether I have or not. I, I, I mean, you know, there's just not. And the reason the Tennessean hadn't written anything is because none of you ladies have been out and stirred something up. So, um, um, I think people, people see that we do have a lot of rights today that, that wouldn't have come about without all of these groups and all of their messages coming into play. Thank you. Now, I was told by Sally Levine that under no circumstances was I, Carol Busey, long of talk, um, <laughs> to talk more than 45 minutes because all of you would really engage the entire group in a discussion here of this. So I have pre pre presented the prepared remarks I have, but I'm happy to entertain any questions uh, from any of you or hear any of your stories one way or the other. Questions? Yes, go ahead. professor at the university said there's no place in medicine for a woman to be a doctor. And she never, she didn't marry for a long time, never had kids, and she was one of the greatest doctors in the world. Well, things have certainly changed today. Uh, I believe it was the last Vanderbilt graduation 
where the founders medalist in the law school and the medical school were both women. And if I, I, I don't have occasion to go to the medical school, but I do go to law school functions because I'm married to a lawyer, and there are more women in those classes than, than men. They are, they are there and present. Yes? But I wanted to follow, follow up and say all of that wouldn't have happened. No. If there hadn't have been, and everybody said vehemently how bad, how bad Betty Friedan was, it makes you guess what really was happening. There was a lot. And see, you really can't separate all of this from the Vietnam War and, and then the, civil, the whole civil rights movement. The civil rights movement really played a tremendous part in the coming of this second wave of citizenship. It really had a lot to do with that. Well, first of all, nationally there are more women in medicine, new women in medicine now. But I have the question, what is the official status of women in the Army now? In the, army? the official status of women in the Army would, pardon me? His question is, he asked me, what is the official status of women in the military, in the Army today? And I, I can't really answer that question except to say, from what I see of my students who are coming back to college at the community college on a GI Bill, women seem to be in every branch of the Army and Navy and Air Force and Marines uh, that is imaginable. Do any of you have any first-hand experience, a daughter, a son, that you could share some light on that? But I assume that they are very much there. As I was uh, hoping uh, I could get here and get in a parking spot, I saw two young people from Vanderbilt walking across the street in Navy ROTC, which those of you who, who remember the late 60s, the Navy ROTC here was gigantic, as was the uh, uh, Army ROTC, I mean, there were hundreds of people in those two. I mean, the Army ROTC even had a band in the late 60s. Can you imagine? But the, there was a man and a woman, and I mean, I, I kind of took that to be, well, it's kind of 50-50. That's not enough of a sampling. Yes, sir. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So that would be complete equality, right? Now, Sam, your son was a naval pilot, and what what could you add to equality for women? Mm -hmm. For example, the question of the current status of the Federal Reserve Bank and the Federal Union Security Exchange Act, that, that's a factor in maybe other than education. That's interesting. And that, my, my son was a combat pilot Pi right. flying an FAA B-1 uh, aircraft. Right. missions right okay yeah that that may that may still be still be the case somebody up here Lottie may I ask what influence if any did first lady have anywhere along the way well I think for her question was what influence did first ladies have along the way I think that's a very interesting question and it's a subject that every time we elect a president we go through this debate of is she going to be the proper first lady, whatever that means, I'm not sure. But certainly you've got a lot, of, still a lot of visibility in the 1960s for Eleanor Roosevelt, although she, you know, had come through that League of Women Voters tradition, not Alice Paul's Women's Party tradition, and she had throughout the 30s and 40s supported protective legislation. Now, I think she kind of veered uh, over to equal rights before her organization did.
but uh, I would think that you've got a lot of, of kind of competing uh, things going on for these women who get to the White House. Uh, we don't have much of a record of what Mrs. Kennedy or Mamie Eisenhower or Mrs. Kennedy did uh, for, or, for women's rights, uh, but clearly the life that Mrs. Kennedy lived uh, in New York as an editor, a publisher, clearly listening to her daughter speak, uh, I think you see that she was uh, 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 very much a, an activist in a very quiet, quiet way. Pat Nixon, I have no notion of anything that she actually said. Rosalind Carter, on the other hand, she created a lot of uh, criticism because she was not staying in her womanly place, whatever that is, but she, it became pretty well known pretty quickly after Jimmy Carter was elected that the person he trusted and the person he listened to the most was Rosalind. And so, you know, she sent out on several world tours on his behalf and that reached, that received a tremendous amount of criticism that he was sending her out as an emissary of the United States. Uh, and then from Carter we went to Nancy Reagan who was speaking out for her particular programs but not so much, she certainly wasn't going to challenge Mrs. Schlafly's uh, position on, on women. And uh, you know the list keeps going on and on, you know who these are. Uh, certainly Mrs. Clinton became highly criticized, as did Bill Clinton when he put her in charge of coming up with a plan to reform the American health care system. And uh, I think we have heard on the news that Michelle Obama has had her challenges in the White House. You've, you've got these men who have married highly educated, very smart women and yet what they can say is very limited. So what I have read in the news is, you know, that some of President Obama's aides have not really necessarily uh, been a pr what they've been telling the president to do. Michelle Obama has not supported what they have told him to do. So it's kind of, I, I would think that would be a really, really difficult job to be in because you have a job but every American looks at what that is she first mother what is what is her job what is her job description we don't know yes um, I, I think there's still a blowback against people who women who consider themselves feminists or men who consider themselves feminists could, could you speak to some of the things that the feminists did accomplish such as childcare rape crisis justice those kinds of things she says she still thinks there's a tremendous amount of kind of resistance. The notion of women's equality for some is is a little bit on the. It, let's not talk about this, you know. Let's let. But uh, what have what has the women's movement equal, accomplished? Well, I, I I will start since we are in the March Madness with Title IX, which was added to the Civil Rights Amendment uh, after Title VII. Title IX said that you cannot discriminate, a college uh, cannot discriminate against women, and where this all plays itself out is in college sports. And so thus all the colleges, now for instance, at Ball State in Gallatin, uh, we suddenly have to, we have a fancy softball field because we have women's softball because the facilities have to be equal and the scholarships you're offering women have to be equal. Now, of course, you know as well as I do that college football and then college basketball bring in hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to the college's athletic department and then that kind of spreads out over the whole college. So they, those two sports, men's uh, athletics and women's athletics, 
uh, our uh, men's athletics particularly, bring in a lot of money. And the colleges have been very careful. I mean, if you look here at Vanderbilt, uh, didn't we win uh, the National Bowling Championship, women bowling and golf? I mean, we've got sports here that we didn't have uh, 25 years ago. So Vanderbilt is doing what it, it, it said it would do. And, you know, you've had some cases get to the Supreme Court about this as to why if we are a small sectarian Christian college in Pennsylvania, why uh, should we have to do this if we don't want to? And uh, the Supreme Court has said, well, you don't have to do it, but guess what? You're not going to get any more federal money. And so they, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, it, it, there are strings attached to a lot of things. So a lot of schools have reluctantly uh, gotten on the bandwagon because federal money even at a school like Vol State, federal money is uh, student loans. It's a whole lot of, it's, it's, it's big colleges, it's research grants, it's a whole lot of things. I think the women's movement has brought the issue of daycare centers front and center, which I think is certainly a needed discussion. Uh, the notion of uh, maternity leave was unheard of once upon a time, and women now and men get maternity uh, and paternity leave when a child is born in this country. Uh, most employers, I would imagine, uh, have some, some kind of leave for new parents out there. Uh, your job can't be taken away from you because you're pregnant, which once upon a time uh, was sort of a, the expected norm. I mean, goodness, you know, you watch the news and lots of the reporters are pregnant these days. So. You know, there's, there, it's a, that is a whole different kind of genre itself. And uh, I think that women have found that they can rise up to a point in corporate America, but many uh, women who have gone up the corporate ladder have complained that they have reached as far as they can go because that bits, many, many big American corporations do not want a woman as the CEO up there at the top. And, you know, you'll see women getting in this, the, all these CE this and that. It just takes me away. Uh, the CFO, the chief financial officer, now some of the public school systems have a CEO that is chief educational officer. You know, everybody's going to the business model of organization, at least a lot of schools are. So anyway, uh, women would tell you they have, have reached a ceiling. And then I think one thing that people are able to do, women and men, that they used not to be able to do is that they can pretty much say, uh, I don't like my job. And so you see a lot more movement, I think, of, of young professionals, men and women alike, than once you saw because uh, you see a lot of, 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 of young people getting into a law firm or getting into a medical group or getting into some business and, and saying, I don't like this. And there was a time when we, nobody had the permission to say that. So, you know, it's fascinating to me uh, uh, as a teacher when I go speak to one of these women's groups, like I spoke to the Law Association for Women, and these women lawyers are telling me, oh, I just always loved history. I wish I had your job. And I want to say, we wish you had my job, not my job, of course, <laughs> but we wish you had a teaching job too, because one of the unintended consequences of all of this is that as women, I mean, when I came through school, I think there were, I, and I worked at the law library at Baylor, uh, when I came through school, there were two women in uh, every class, two or three women in the three classes of the Baylor Law School. It was done, but it was not done very much, and most of us were, uh, ed, uh, want, we were getting a degree in English, or in my case, history, but we, we, the understanding was we were going to become teachers. And nursing was an accepted uh, 
uh, professional career path, but we, we, we were mostly going into these jobs that by the nature of the job, we considered them women specific. And so um, now here is the problem with education. A lot of these younger people, women, and to a lesser degree men, but both, uh, have said, well, why would I want to be a teacher when I can uh, uh, be uh, something else and make four times as much money? And I read an editorial, I think this was today's Thursday, I think it was in Tuesday's New York Times, um, who reads the New York Times op-ed page? Sam, I know you, a lot of you. What, is it Joe Nacera? What's the name of the columnist? No, Joe Nacera? He had a very poignant column about going to Washington to visit one of his mentors who had come up at, through the ranks of the New Deal and then been in the Peace Corps, worked with Sergeant Shriver. And his point, the, the point of this uh, elderly gentleman, Joe's mentor, was that there was a time when people said, well, I want to go into public service, and public service meant politics or teaching, and today what people say is, I want a job that makes a lot of money. And so there, you know, we've, we've lost a lot of women and men in education. That's not to say that there aren't good people coming up through the ranks to teach, but what I am saying is that there are fewer of them than there once were out there. Yes, Bird? Many of us remember <coughs> when married women were not allowed to be teachers. That's right. And many people were concealing the fact that they were married. And, and you and I know that's what stimulated the League of Women Voters so well because these Vanderbilt professors came here in the 50s after World War after World War I, people like Dewey Grantham came here and uh, they uh, had these very smart wives with them and so these women had a lot of energy and they joined the League of Women Voters and did a tremendous amount for the community. But today a Vanderbilt professor, who a male professor who takes a job or a female professor, it's a much more kind of complex dance because, you know, you got to figure out where is she going to work? Are we going to find her a position at Vanderbilt? Where is, is she going to get a job? And I, I got a call just a few weeks ago from the chair of the department at uh, MTSU because they've hired a woman as a Russian historian and her husband got a Ph.D. in American history and he's got to have a job. So, you know, there's a, it's a whole much more complex notion than it used to be. The spousal moving is hard to do. Yes? Uh, what is your take on the alleged uh, war on women in Congress and the state legislatures nowadays? Well, uh, my take on the war, alleged war on women in Congress and the legislatures, I believe it exists. I want to make sure that I make, I say this before I leave, the first woman to serve in the Tennessee General Assembly was an anti-suffragist. She had opposed women getting the right to vote, but then once it happened, she realized that she could use this vote, and you see that happening. And the, the conservative women in Congress who are providing a fair amount of the pushback are as vocal as some of the men who are doing it. But I do, th I think it exists, and, and I think women use that as, if, as effectively as men do. And, and that's, that's discussed all the time, but uh, I, think there's, I think there's some evidence of that. You know, we still want women to dress and act like women. We don't want women to be sort of non-gendered. Uh, this is an over, a gross overgeneralization. But we want women to have some, whatever you call it, I don't know, but some femininity about them. And, and we, we, but I, I do want to say one thing about the ERA. 
I read a book. Let me, I've got the name of it right here. I'll tell you what the name of it is that many of you would probably find very interesting. Uh, the name of the book is Freedom for Women, Forging the Women's Liberation Movement, 1953 to 1970. Uh, it came out by the University of Florida Press by a woman named uh, Carol Giardina, uh, published in 1910. And her argument is, tw I mean, uh, yes, 2010, yes. Thank you, thank you. I talk faster than I think. I will try to slow the talking down. But this book really talks a whole lot about writing African-American women into the narrative of the woman's movement because, you know, historians have, have just, you know, kind of compartmentalized black women, civil rights, uh, white women, women's rights. I mean, that, that has happened. And this is a really quite an interesting book. She talks about the fight within the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, about women and other things. But her conclusion is at the end, she gets to the ERA and she says that the ERA failed precisely because the moderate white leaders took over the National Organization for Women and marginalized the black women who were in the organization. And her argument, which is the same as Paula Giddings, some of you probably read When and Where I Enter by her, her argument is roughly the same that the ERA, the, the National Organization for Women, uh, lost a, a great deal of momentum by becoming more mainstream. In other words, she argues that if the National Organization for Women had stayed out there, way out there, uh, the ERA would have passed. So it's an interesting book and I enjoyed reading it. Yes. I do. I mean, anytime, you know, don't you take, I didn't take, well, I actually did take physics, but I don't remember anything about it. So for those of you who are physics professors, come provide me a lifeline, throw me a lifeline here. But there is, for every action, there's a positive and equal reaction. So of course, I mean, you know, the pendulum is already swinging, but I think the, what we haven't seen before, at least what I haven't really seen is, uh, the extremes out here that we've got with, with so few really in the middle and that's what to me is troubling about Congress right now that people just aren't talking to each other if they are, if they are not of the same political party. And so that, you know, and we've, I'm sure uh, all of you have, have thought a lot about all of the communication changes and the positive and negative aspects of having instant news at your fingertips. One of my students came in to my office uh, last semester breathless. Oh, Dr. Busey, I'm glad I caught you here. Congress just passed a law to abolish the Bill of Rights. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I was, I was uh, particularly heartbroken to hear this from this young man because I had I spent more time in history one on the Constitution than anything else. I think Americans need to know what's in the Constitution. And I said, you don't believe that, do you? And he said, well, I got an email about it and so-and-so in our class heard it on, on the news. And I said, but what did you learn in my class about the Constitution? Well, it, it's right here on the internet. And, and you know, every, everything I had taught him about process had gone for naught. And I can assure you that, that even though I set him straight, that was just too juicy a little bite not to email you, Tommy. It was just too, too juicy. Even though his history professor told him that was crazy, he, he couldn't resist sending it on. And that, you know, and you got this, taking the, talk about taking the hose and spraying, it's everywhere. 
Uh, the name of it is Freedom for Women. There are a lot of books out there now about the women's movement, and uh, they're really they're really quite interesting. Uh, get yourself a kind of a survey book, Joan. Oh, women on juries. Yes, yes. Now you know that brings to mind another subject, which is women owning property. Uh, married women, as you know, there are a lot of things they couldn't do, but one of the things they couldn't do was own property, and 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 that was what was part of the convention called at Seneca Falls in 1848. So uh, uh, along with that, women could not serve on juries even if a woman was being tried. Uh, the idea was that women didn't need to be a part of that and some states approved it. Tennessee did not approve it until the 1950s, it, we were fairly late in approving jury service for women in Tennessee. Uh, there is a woman who works at the Attorney General's office named Ruth Ann Thompson. She is, has a degree in history from Vanderbilt and she has done a lot of work on that, but uh, it, was, it was fairly late when Tennessee gave women the right to serve on, on juries. Professor Covington, what year is, is 53 maybe? I'm trying to, to, to remember. You're, you're very close, uh, 53, 54. There was, there was a period when it was an option also. Uh, they could serve, but just being a female, they did not get to excuse as a matter of right. Right, you know? right. And I, I did not get excused uh, last year, and um, it was not that much fun. Um, <laughs> And I'm sure that, that male and female alike, you know, the, the juries, uh, it is a very difficult job to, the, to be on a jury. It is a very difficult job. Well, yes, sir, one last question, and then y'all got up. How do we compare to uh, Western Europe in terms of uh, women's rights? Have they progressed as well as we have, or are we behind? Well, that I think depends on who you ask. Uh, I think that we're probably all more or less facing some of the same issues. I do think uh, that European women have not had the luxury of staying at home and not working that Ameri many American women have had. And uh, I think that is a difference. European women have been in the workforce longer than American women have been in the workforce. Thank you all so much for your attention.